Our lecture today is on liability of partners. So this uh, video lecture is being video during the movement control order, which is actually on uh, April two twenty twenty twenty, and because of that, it's there with the uh, limited facilities with regards to the uh, filming of this video. So let us go on with our discussion today, which is on liability of partners. So if you can see from the, the, the screen actually, there are seven subtopics which will be discussed under this uh, liability of partners. So these subtopics are actually contractual liability, tortious liability, criminal liability, liability for misapplication of money or property or documents which is being in the custody of the firm or the partners of the firm, the liability for improper employment of trust property, liability of persons who holds out, and lastly, the liability of incoming and retiring partners. Okay, let us discuss with regard to contractual liability first. So this contractual liability is covered under section 11 of the Partnership Act. And if we look at this section, the section says here, every partner in the firm is liable jointly with the other partners for all debts and obligations of the firm incurred while he is a partner and after his death his estate is also severally liable in the due cost of administration for such debts and obligations so far as they remain unsatisfied but subject to prior payment of his separate debts if we can see from this section actually this section has been divided into two parts whereby I have mentioned actually this in my in my slide it's been divided into two parts the first part is with regards to joint liability so here it says liable jointly so this joint liability is for living partners so those partners who is still alive whereas the several liability this is for deceased partner a partner who is already dead okay so this section 11 it's been divided into two parts and it discussed with regards to the liability of partners while the partner is still living and the second part after, uh, if the partner uh, is already there. So what will happen to it? So the uh, important part, I have highlighted it in purple. So the, this is the important part. So if this is the part whereby you can see that I have divided it into two parts. Okay. So now let's go on with the first part the joint liability with regards to the living partners you can see here this joint liability it says that he's jointly liable for all debts and obligations which are incurred while each is a partner so it says here that the liability is a joint liability and what does it mean to me so i explain further here it says here a legal action can be taken against one or all the partners to recover the debt. Legal action can also be taken in the firm's name. This way, all the partners and the firm are assumed to have been mentioned in the action as if the action has been taken against each individual partners. So what it means here is that if, let's say, an action has been taken, a summons has been filed towards the firm under the firm's name. So let's say the, 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 the names of the firm is ABC Enterprise. So a suit that we file towards ABC Enterprise, then under that situation, who actually is ABC Enterprise? ABC Enterprise is actually the partners of ABC Enterprise. Let's say who is the partners in ABC Enterprise? Let's say it's Amina and Abu Bakar. Okay? And the action is being taken towards ABC Enterprise. Then under that situation, Amina and Abu Bakar will be jointly liable to the same action. So meaning if a judgment is obtained against ABC Enterprise, then Amina and Abu Bakar, they need to pay their judgment, the judgment debt. Okay. So if let's say the action is not being taken against the firm's name, however, it's against the name of the partners. Okay. So if the action is being taken against Abu Bakar, then can or not, and the plaintiff after that, after after he filed a suit against Abu Bakar, he wanted to file another suit against Amina because uh, he found out actually the Abu Bakar cannot afford actually to pay the judgment debt. Under the situation, the plaintiff have lost his right. Why? 
because uh, the plaintiff had chosen to sue only Abu Bakr. So if the plaintiff wanted to wanted both partners to be liable, then they need to file under the firm's name, need to file suit under the firm's name, or if it's not so, they need to file it under both names, under Abu Bakr and Aminah's name. Then only both parties will be liable jointly under that situation. Okay, let us discuss further. I've stated that joint liability means that if a plaintiff chooses to, to take a legal action against one of the partners, then uh, he lost his right to claim the action towards the other partners. So let us have a look at the case of Kendall versus Hamilton. Then. So in this case of Kendall versus Hamilton, this Kendall he had given a loan to two partners, which is X and Y. And then this Kendall, after that, he took a legal action to recover back the debts, the loan which he had given to X and Y. So he sued X and Y. Okay? And subsequently, after that, X and Y becomes bankrupt. So when X and Y become bankrupt, they cannot afford to pay the same debts. And then Kendrick realized that actually that is actually another partner who is Hamilton. And now he took up this case again, Hamilton. Can Kendall do this? No, he could, could not do that. Why? Because they have chosen to, to sue X and Y. Okay? So this is what is meant by joint liability. So it was how that actually under that situation, he have lost the case. Okay, he cannot sue Hamilton. Okay? So if this partner who is jointly liable, when they when they are still partners, they are jointly liable. Okay? And then uh, suddenly one of the partners dies. So what happened? To the partners who is already dead, so will he still be liable uh, on on the debts uh, which is uh, which is incurred by the firm? Then under the situation, that liability will goes on the surviving partners. Then what what about him? So that's why we are not we need to discuss the second part of section eleven. So the second part says. The liability is a several liability. So what it means by several liability? So several liability means that so whatever funds which belongs to the estate of the deceased partner, so because he is already there, then under the situation, you know, all all the property of the deceased partner of a dead person, whatever pro property belongs to him now, is being administered. Is being administered by the executors or the administrator of the estate of the deceased person. So the administrator or the executors need to need to actually uh, manage the property in a way that uh, he need to settle all the debts belonging to the deceased partner first. If there is balance, if there is balance, then only that balance will be used to pay the debts. Of the firm, okay. So meaning, the um, estate, the property of a deceased partner, will not be used to pay off the debts of the firm first. However, it will be used to settle the debts of the estate of the deceased. So let's say he uh he owes income tax department, right? Or let's say he have owe, he owes credit card. So this will be settled first, and if there if, if, if there is balance, then the balance will, however, whatever amount owned by the firm, need to be settled by the living partners first. First, and if that is not enough, then only we can look uh, after the, uh, the, the the property of the disease. And that also, if there is balance, if there is no balance, then of course. Yeah, the administrator or the executors of the disease uh, property will not be liable actually to settle that that, that, that that okay so we have completed with regards to contractual liability so now let's go on to with regards to tortious liability <clears throat> so a tortious liability is a liability this is a civil offense okay this is something which is wrong. It's actually, it's not criminal. It's not criminal wrong. It's only a civil offense. Okay, if it's a, if it's a criminal wrong, then of course the public prosecutor will take action against the same partners. 
However, if this is a civil wrong, what is a civil wrong? So, um, let's say this is a partnership. It's a legal firm you know, between a few lawyers. And then they give wrong advice. So, this is negligence. It's wrong. It's negligence. So, however the advice has been given by one of the partners, then will the rest of the partners be liable towards said negligence done by that partner who give the wrong advice? So, that is what we are going to discuss today. Okay? So, meaning that the liability does not arise because of contract. Okay? So, these thoughts, it arises independent of a contract. So, as I told you just now, this is actually a civil a civil wrong and the types of this civil wrong as I told is negligence a part of negligence maybe it's nuisance or maybe it's defamation or other kinds of civil wrong which is being committed by one of the partners so we are going to determine today whether the rest of the partners who did not commit the wrongdoing will the rest of the partners be liable towards the wrongdoing done by these partners so if we, we go to section 12 of the partnership it says here where by any wrongful act or omission of any partner acting in the ordinary course of the business of the firm or with the authority of his co-partners loss or injury is caused to any person not being a partner in the firm or any penalty is incurred the firm is liable that thereafter to the same extent as the partner so acting or omitting to act okay so if we look through this section it says the firm is liable when it says the firm is liable, meaning the other partners, the rest of the partners will also be liable towards that civil, civil wrong, towards that wrongdoing. So I have lighted the important part here. It says that wrong, wrongful act or omission. Wrongful act or omission which is being done by one of the partners. However, it needs to be done in the ordinary cost of the business of the firm. Or with the authority of his co-partners so meaning if it's not in the honorary cause of business so the person committing the civil wrong did it with the authority given to him by the other partners so that's why i told you just now it's been divided into two parts the first part in the honorary cause of the business of the firm so we need to look at what type of firm is this if this is a legal firm then we need to look at what is the ordinary cost of business of a legal firm? Okay, if this is a if if this is an accountancy firm, then what actually is the ordinary cost of business of an accountancy firm? Okay, and the second part, if this is not being done in the ordinary cost of business, however, the state partners who committed the civil wrong did it with the authority of the other partners, then the firm will be held liable. And this, this civil wrong, this tortured liability is actually jointly and severally liable. So it's very different from what I discussed with you with regards to contractual liability because under contractual liability, we said that if the partner is still alive, then they will be jointly liable. However, if one of the partners is already dead, then the partner, the DJ's partner will be severally liable. However, under these uh, thoughts, okay, the liability is a jointly and severally liable. So, meaning if a plaintiff chooses to sue one of the partners and, and, and then the, the said judgment that is not recovered yet, meaning the amount he receives is not enough to satisfy the debt which he has granted to the, to the firm, he can then take an action against other partners. If he found out actually there is other partners involved, he can take this action against the other parties. He will not lose his right. The plaintiff will not lose his right. So the case of Kendall just now will not be applicable here in the case of tortious liability. Okay? So we are going to discuss in detail with regards to this. With regards to this uh, liability for acts or actions uh, done in the ordinary course of business. The first part is now. So what is meant by uh, liability for act or omission done in, a, in the ordinary course of the business of the firm? <clears throat> so let us have a look at the case of 
Hamelin was assistant here. So in Hamelin was assistant, what happened? So a partner in each and company bribe a club in the rival firm. So he bribed a club in the rival firm. Why bribe that club in the rival firm? Because he wanted a confidential information from that rival firm. So he so he bribed this club and then and then this club revealed that information. And because this club revealed the information to him, and because of that, yeah, the uh, company then suffered damages. The other company, the rival company, suffered damages, and because of that, the other company, the rival company, now is suing Asian company for damages. Okay, so the court held that Asian company were liable. So why are they liable? You know, with regards to the um fraud done by one of these partner because according to the court it is ordinary you look here the word is that it says that this is an ordinary action in the ordinary course of the business of of a business entity they wanted to obtain information of a rival company this is common okay obtaining information of uh, of a trade secret of other companies this is normal they wanted to obtain this information this is normal so all other all other business entity will also do, do the same thing okay because this is normal so because of that the court have actually this is actually in the ordinary course of business and court have that is in immaterial whether the partner did it legitimately or illegitimately okay so because of that uh, the whole firm is being had liable then they need to pay damages towards the rival, the rival company. So, okay. So, what is the meaning of an act which is done in the ordinary course of business? What is the meaning of this? Because uh, our our financial act is silent on this. So, we need to have a look at the case of this Walker versus European Electronic Property Limited. <coughs> so, this involves an accountancy firm. Okay, so this is accountancy firm and what happened in this case is that this partner in this accountancy firm so before this he have never done uh, matters pertaining to receivership so receivership is a situation where the company is uh, cannot cannot uh, pay their debts so they become insolvent okay then under the situation the creditor will appoint the receiver to manage this the same company however this say accountant have never have never deals with this kind of things however he's being appointed to deal with this and and now and, 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 and now that and now that there is negligence on his part and now the court need to determine whether receivership work is actually uh within the scope of business within the ordinary cost of business of an accountancy firm and the court how actually this is actually a practice uh, among accountants it's normal accountants because in fact in this firm all the other partners it's normal for them to deal with regards to receivership it's just that this particular accountant he have never done it before and because of that he is negligent in conducting his his job and the court how because it's normal for a country firm to to uh, conduct this kind of business and because of that the inference under the situation the court say is that their business will include the acceptance of the appointment of receiver or receiver and manager and the doings of act done to carry out such an appointment so what the court means here this is something normal for an accountancy firm to do this and because of that this particular uh, firm will be held liable yeah, though this partner has never done something with regards to receivership okay Okay, so now let us go on with the second part whereby I discussed you just now. The first part which says that it must be in the ordinary course of business whereby the second part here, if it's not in the ordinary course of business, then it must be done with the authorization of the other partners. So what is mean by uh, authorization of the other partners? So let us look here. Uh, we are going to discuss with regards to this liability for act done with the consent of the partners or authorization by the other partners. So, 
I've stated here, say, where a partner is given, where, where the partner is given authority, meaning he's being authorized to act on behalf, on behalf of the firm by the rest of the partners, then the firm is liable for his thought, even if the authorization is not, meaning the authorization seeking him to do something actually is something which is not lawful. However, what he did is that he carried it out in an unlawful manner. Then under the situation, the court will be held liable. So let's say, let's say <clears throat> the partners gave an authorization for a particular partner to uh, approach a bank for a bank loan, to obtain a bank loan for the firm. So he's been given this authorization to do that. So this is not unlawful, okay? So however, he carried it out in an unlawful manner. So how I say he carried it out in, in an unlawful manner? Maybe he gave pressure to the bank manager, okay? So this is wrong. How, how, how could he give pressure to the uh, bank manager to approve the loan to the state firm? Okay, so under the situation, though, the firm did not authorize him to pressure the bank manager. However, this is how he carried it out, how he carried out his task. Uh, uh, since he's been given authorization to obtain, to, to obtain the state loan, then under the situation, the other partners also will be held liable for the wrongful act which he did in making sure that the loan is being approved. So if the other partners did not give actual authority, so this authority must be given actual. The authority must be an actual authority. Okay, it's not an implied authority. So if we committed aside of the um, scope of the partners, partnership usual authority, then the firm and the other partners will be not will not be held liable. Okay. So, meaning, if we did something which is not in the honorary cause or business of the firm, then he must be given an actual authority. So, maybe may, maybe it's in writing, okay, um, that he is allowed to do this. Okay. Uh, implied authority will not, will not be used here. So, the said partner who perform on, the, on behalf of the firm for something which is not in the honorary cost of business of the firm, so he must have an actual authority to do that. So let's say this is a legal firm. What is the ordinary ordinary business of a legal firm? The ordinary business of a legal firm is to go to court, to um, conduct transaction in regards to legal matters. This is an ordinary cost of business. So let's say if the partners then bought something for the firm. He bought a car for the firm. Then this is not in the ordinary course of a business of a legal firm. Then under the situation, will the rest of the partners be held liable? They will be held liable if this particular partner is being given actual authority. If he is not being given this auto authority, then the rest of the partners will not be held liable. Okay, so now let, let us go on with criminal liability. Criminal liability. So for criminal liability, so just now we discussed with regard to civil wrong. So with regard to civil wrong, we said that uh, if one of the partners committed something which is unlawful, if it is done in the ordinary course of business, then the other partners will be held liable. If it's not in the ordinary course of business, then if he is being authorized, then the other partners will be held liable, okay? However, for criminal criminal liability, because for, an, for a criminal action, it requires mens rea. It requires the intention, the mind of the person who committed the offense. And because of that, yeah, we cannot make the partners who does not have the main area. We cannot make the partners who does not have intention to come. Okay, students, so we are still on criminal liability. 
as I have told you earlier, under criminal liability, we cannot make uh, the other partners who did not commit the uh, crime to be liable to the state crime. Because why? Because we need to have mens rea. We need to have the intention. So meaning the person who have the intention to commit the crime, only that person alone will be liable to the state crime. So this is what has been uh, said by Lord Winjury in the case of Garrett versus Hooper, whereby the judge, the Lord in that case says that the general rule is that in criminal law, a principal cannot be made liable for offences which need mens rea, which means it says that um, if the agent is the one who commits the said crime, then he cannot be made liable because he does not have the intention to commit it. He does not have the mens rea. He does not have the mind to commit the said crime. Okay, because the said crime, the agent is the one who have the mens rea to commit the said the said crime. Okay, now let's have a look at this munition case of Chung Shin Kian and another was the PP here, whereby this case involves this firm of two partners. The firm involved in this business of tailoring business. Okay, so whereby. The uh, said business have been raided by the trade description department. Okay, so ada ada berlaku uh, pemeriksaan lah eh, by the trade description department, and then the um, trade description department discovered actually the said business have misused the brand name Texwood. Okay, they saw this brand name Texwood. You know, on the uh, jeans and jackets which have been sold at the place of business there. However, on that particular time, only one of the partners is, the, is there, where, whereas the other partner was not there. And because of that, the court held in this case that the second partner was not liable. Why he's not liable? Because the court held the Partnership Act only covers joint liability for contracts and nothing was mention with regard to with regards to criminal liability okay students so we have finished with, with this uh, criminal liability we are going to go on with liability for misapplication of money or property of a third person so these are the um these are the money or the property or the document which is being uh, held either by the firm or either by one of the partners yeah, in the state firm and then he mis misappropriated, he misapplied the state uh, either document, money or the property belonging to the state person and most of the time the state person is the client of the state, of the state firm and uh, this is being covered under section 30A, you can see there under section 30A and uh, section 30B yeah, of the Partnership Act Sorry, student, I think I need to remove this, this wasp of flower because it has been disturbing me all, all, all the while. Okay, let me continue. Because this section 13A and uh, section 13B, okay, says here, the section says here, we read here, and, and, and the important uh, part of the section I have highlighted in red says here, where one partner acting within the scope of his apparent authority receives the money or property of a third person and misapplies it. This is section 13A. So the important words there is when where one partner, meaning one of the partner is the one who acts in his apparent authority. Apparent authority, I think I've discussed you uh, this before this, yeah, and the other topics before this. So apparent authority is the authority which outsiders look at you, the outsiders actually uh, presume that you have this kind of authority because most of the business, if this is a kind of business, let's say if this is a lawyer, we know that the lawyer goes to court, a lawyer handle legal documents, okay? So this is the apparent authority of a lawyer. So meaning, if one of the partner within the scope of his apparent authority, meaning that kind of business, he have this kind of authority because all the other types of partners will have similar authority like this kind of business receive the money or property he receives the same money or the same property of that client and then he misapplies it and where a firm so the second part B 13B so this is with regards to a firm so just now when only one partner this is when a firm the firm itself in the course of its business 
receive the money or property of a third person, meaning he receive the money or the property or the document of a client. Okay, and what the firm did is that the money or property so received is misapplied by one or more of the partners while it is in the custody of the firm. So meaning the said money or the said property or the said document now is being as misapplied while it is in the custody of the firm. I, I have also highlighted the, the important wording in the said section. Then if this is to occur, this is to happen, then under that situation the firm is the one who, who will be liable and they need to make good of the loss suffered by the client, by the third party. Okay, so that is the two sections just now. I've informed you. A, it says uh, when the said money or property or document is received by a partner and the B part, when the money or property is received by the firm itself. So let us continue with this discussion with regards to money or property or document when it is received by the partner. So under the situation, as I highlighted to you earlier, whereby I have highlighted in red, okay, the wording is that he must act within his apparent authority and then he misapplies it. Then only the firm will be made liable. Okay? So the question here, student, is that whether that person who misapplied the state we wish misuse the said property or the said document or the said money. Okay, does that person have authority to receive it? Okay, and what are that kind of acceptance are regarded regarded as within the scope of that partner's apparent authority? So kita nak tengok sekarang. Okay, dia ada kuasa nak terima atau tidak. Dan kita nak tengok dalam dalam skop yang bagaimana dalam 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 kuasa nampak seseorang uh, rakan kongsi tersebut. Okay, to 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 handle with regards to this question and to be more clear on this on this issue, we are going to differentiate between these two cases. The case of Harmon versus Johnson and the case of Earl of Dundonat versus Masterman. Whereby in these both cases, it involves a legal firm. Okay, it involves lawyers. Both involve lawyers and under both situations, under both situations, money was received by the state firm. So let us have a look at the case of Hamon, whereby the money was received and the money was being given to the said um, to the said partner to invest. Can you see the word to invest? Yeah, to invest. Okay, and this is not within the scope of the apparent authority of the said partner of the firm. The court held that is not within the apparent authority. Whereas in the case of Earl of Dunda or not, the money also was received by the partner in the firm. However, the money was received in the course of the management and settlement of the affair of the client. Okay? And what happened is that this money had already been misappropriated by one of the partners. And then the firm is being held liable. So why in the case of Harmon, the court held that the firm is not liable, whereas in the case of Dun Donald, the court held that the firm is liable. Why is it so, student? Because in the case of Hormon, the money was being given to the partner to be invested. And a legal firm is a not a business of legal firm to do investment on behalf of the client. So if you wanted to invest money, maybe you should you should go and seek an advice from a stockbroker or somebody else who is an expert in that field and not a lawyer. So that's why. The court had actually, this is not within the apparent authority of, uh, of the said partners. Whereas, in the case of Dundonat, the money is being received for management and settlement of the affair of the clients. You know, a legal firm, what they did for their business, they settle um, legal docu documentation cases on behalf of the, of the client. And, and most of the time, when they when they try to settle, when they negotiate on behalf of the client, then the money will be paid to the lawyers and they will have it on trust. This is the normal, um, normal authority of, of a legal firm, to receive money on behalf of the client uh, to be handed over to other parties in the process of negotiation. Okay? So that's why in this situation, the court held actually, this is within the apparent authority of 
of this legal firm because this is a normal for a legal firm to do this. They settle uh, the matters, legal matters uh, with regards to disputes arising between their clients and uh, the other third parties and, and they are the one who will actually uh, make payment on behalf of their client. So okay, let us go on here. Apart from that, yeah, apart from that, if we want to make the firm liable, liable why? Liable because the state uh, property or the state money or the state document is being handed to the firm and uh, later on is being misappropriated, uh, misappropriated sorry, by one of the partners. So when can we make the firm liable? So apart from what I discussed with you just now, if you if you can uh, recall back section 13, subsection B just now, the word is that it must be in the uh, custody of the firm, one thing, and the person who uh, who lies with the firm, the, the person who um, went and gave the money to the firm, he he must actually go and see the firm because he want to do transaction with the firm and not with a partner of the firm because maybe uh, that, that that person is his friend then under that situation the firm will not be had liable to make uh, it much much more clearer with regard to what i'm trying to tell you today is this let's have a look at the case of british home assurance corporation here so remember in the case of british home assurance corporation what happened is this British Home Assurance Corporation okay, appointed this accusant as their solicitor. Okay, why they uh, why they appointed this accusant as their solicitor? Because they want the accusant to act on their behalf in this mortgage transaction. Okay, that yeah, mortgage transaction. However, on the uh, 5th of February 1901, this accusant have given notice to British Homes that now they are taking in new partner, which is Patterson, and now they are changing their name, the full name, from Atkinson to Atkinson and Patterson. Okay? So meaning they had already informed their client, well, now the change, the, the firm name have changed, and, and we are taking in new partners, which is actually Mr. Patterson. Okay, and the, the firm name had already been changed to Atkinson and Patterson, and then on the 28th of February, so the notice was being given to the client on the 5th of February. And on the 28th of February, what the client do, what the company did, what the British Home Insurance did, they sent into this Mr. Eccleston a check payable to Eccleston and Eccleston. Whereby they are fully aware, actually now, the firm name had already been changed to uh, Eccleston and Peterson, but still they issued chair under Eccleston and Eccleston. And then what happened is that this Mr. Eccleston misappropriated the state check. And now British Home is suing Patterson. Will Patterson be liable then, student? No, the court held no. Patterson is not liable. Why is he not liable in this situation? Because when British Homes acted, actually, he wanted to deal with Mr. Eccleston. Because why? Because he issued a check under Eccleston and Eccleston. When they are fully aware now that the firm name has changed. When they are fully aware now the firm has new partners. Okay? So under that situation, Patterson cannot be made liable. Why? Because it shows clearly from the check issued, they are only willing to deal with Mr. Eccleston. Okay? So now, let us go on with regards to money which is being received by the firm. So just now, money received by a partner of the firm. So now this is a discussion with regards to money which is being received by the firm itself. So these are money which is being received by third party and most of the time the third party is the client of the firm or somebody else who have dealings with the client, on, uh, client of the firm and, and the firm is acting on behalf of your client. So, if this money is received by the firm and is being misapplied by one of the partners in the firm, so whatever document, whatever money, whatever property received by the firm, it must be actually in the custody of the firm. Then only the firm can be made liable. 
and it must be in the ordinary course of the phone business. So, so then let us have a look at the case of Rod Oster's moles so that we can get a clear picture of this situation. In this case, this Rod, he wished to obtain a loan. So since he wanted to obtain a loan, he need to give security. And because of that, he mortgaged his property. However, he was being told by one Ryu. Ryu is actually a partner of a solicitor firm. This firm is Mrs. Hudges and Masterman. Ryu informed these rocks that actually uh, the uh, mortgages, the creditor who was supposed to give the loan, they wanted additional security. So meaning the mortgage is not enough and they need an additional security. So what happened? So this Mr. Roth, what he did, he hand over to this Ryu a warrant, some warrants which is payable to bearer. So a warrant is similar like a check, okay, similar like a check, and this warrant is payable to bearer. So when Ryu receives this warrant, what this Ryu did, this Ryu fellow, he misappropriated them. He made use of the warrant, okay? And now, Rod is suing the firm with regards to his loss. He suffered damage. He suffered loss because the state warrants have been misappropriated by this new. And the Court of Appeal, COO is a Court of Appeal. Court of Appeal held that the action succeeded, meaning, meaning, what, what does it mean? So this, this means that, this means that now Rod wins the case. Why Rod wins the case? Because the warrants is received by the firm, yeah, received by the firm in the ordinary course of the business. A legal firm is normal for a legal firm to handle this kind of transition. Okay. All this convincing transition. When you buy a property, you want to, to charge a property, you want to, to lease a property. So all this is being done by by legal firm. So this is something which is normal. This is something which it really is in the ordinary course of business of a legal firm. And apart from that, just now, I have written to you also, to make the firm liable, the said money or the said property or the said document must be in the custody of the firm. So let us have a look in the case of Tendering 100 Waterworks Company vs. Jones, whereby in this case of Tendering 100 Waterworks Company vs. Jones, this plaintiff, this tendering what to work, they wanted to they wanted to buy an estate. Okay? They wanted to buy an estate and the name of the estate is Lawford Estate. They wanted to buy this estate. And they employed this solicitor's firm. They uh, they employed this legal firm by the name of Jones and Garat. And this Jones and Garat, they are actually partners in this firm. These are two partners. So what did Tenery Hundred Water Works did? This is for their own convenience. They feel this is, they feel that this is for their convenience. What they did, they arranged that the property, they arranged that this estate is to be conveyed into Garrett's name. They put it under Garrett's name, okay, and not under their name. They put it under Garrett's name, and then later on, the vendor, the seller of the estate, hand over to Garrett's the title deeds the document of title pertaining to the estate, estate the grant of the estate, estate. They hand it over to Garrett, and what happens, students, Garrett then used this deed, this grant now, this document of title, he used it as security to enable him to borrow money from one Mr. Nant. Actually, that is not his property. It's just that, it's just that tendering 100 auto put it under his name. Okay? So now, what happened? Later on, the partnership was dissolved. The partnership between Jones and Garrett was dissolved. And plaintiff now brought an action against Jones. He claimed that Jones is actually liable. Okay? So what was held by the court? The court held that he failed in his claim. Why, student? Why he failed in his claim under this situation? He failed in his claim because the conduct of the plaintiff by by putting Garrett's name on the title deed okay and then by giving uh, the title deeds to Garrett it shows actually that the state document the title deeds and everything okay were not in the custody of the firm it was in the custody of Garrett and because of that 
It's not fair to make the firm liable. It's not fair to make the other partners liable. Why? Because what is the intention of the plaintiff when he did this? What is the intention of the plaintiff when he puts the name to the said deeds under Garrett's name? Meaning his intention is that to give it to Garrett. So meaning it's under Garrett's custody and it's not under the custody of the said of the said firm. Okay? So let us go on with the next subtopic. This is liability for improper employment of trust property for partnership purposes. What is a trust property? A trust property is when a partner held certain property as a trustee. So meaning that the state property does not belong to the partners, however he holds it on trust for a beneficiary. So let's say you are in a class, you collect money, Okay, and that money you put it in fund, and that fund, okay, that fund is being kept by your class rep. So your class rep is actually a trustee, and you all are actually the beneficiary. Okay, so that fund, that money, which is being kept by class, your class rep, that is not his money. That money belongs to the whole class. Okay. And if he misappropriated, what will happen? So this is the case. If let's say one of the partners is a trustee, whereby he holds somebody else's property on behalf of that somebody else, and what he did later on as a trustee, he made use of that money for his business, for this partnership business. Then, will the firm be liable? Or, or will the other partner of the, of the firm be liable to the same beneficiary? So this is being discussed under section 15 of the Partnership Act. Let us have a look at the content of section 15 here, student. Section 15 states that if a partner being a trustee improperly employs trust property in the business or on the account of the partnership, no other partner is liable. What is important words there, student? No other partner is liable. What does it mean? Meaning... The firm will not be liable, the other partners cannot be made liable to the person's beneficiary interested therein. Provided, can you see that I put it in red here, provided, provided meaning that firm will be made liable, that partners will be made liable if A, that firm or that partners have notice of that breach of trust, meaning he is fully aware that this is a trust property and this partner now misapplying and, and make use of the state trust property for the state business. A and B, nothing in this section shall prevent trust money from being followed and recovered from the firm if, if still in its possession or under its control. Meaning that if this trustee misapply the trust money, he wanted to use it for the business and it is still with the business, it is still with the firm, then the beneficiary can actually recover the said money. Meaning the said money can be taken from the said firm. Okay? So let us have a look at the case of expected expate Hitton. Expate Hitton here, whereby this one, a father and a son, they were partners in a business. And the son actually is a trustee of a will. Dia adalah pemegang amanah satu wasiat. So what the son did, he used the same money for the purpose of the partnership business. Okay? And now the firm went bankrupt. And the court held that this money, which has, which has been misused, cannot be recovered from the partnership property. Why? Because the money is not there anymore. Okay, so that's why it cannot be recovered. If the money is still there, if the money is still there, of course it can be re recovered. Okay. Just now we said, if the partner has noticed, meaning if the other partner is aware of the misappropriation of the said uh, property, of the said money, then the other partner will be made liable because of the word provided is now, remember? So let us have a look at the case of Jacobs versus Morris. Because there is no way under the Partnership Act which 
actually elaborate how are we going to assume when actually the other partners have knowledge whether this is a this is a trust property or not so in Jacob versus Morris it was how that this knowledge it can either be actual knowledge or implied knowledge what is an, an implied knowledge then an implied knowledge is the knowledge which a reasonable man can reasonable obtain so meaning if let's say the partner is a poor guy and suddenly he brought him a huge amount of money as a reasonable man of course the other partner should put this into an inquiry from where actually he get the the money okay that what should be done by a reasonable man orang yang mana sabar akan buat benda ni ha, dengan mengetahui arah kan fungsi ini seorang yang miskin dapat duit yang banyak ini daripada mana okay. so if actually he knew actually that this is actually a breach of trust then he will be made liable or if you have implied knowledge so when you say you have implied knowledge we will look at what will be done by a reasonable man so okay so then now we are going to go on with the liability of the other subtopic liability of holding out what is a holding out a holding out you can read here from my notes here yeah i put it there what does it mean a holding out a holding out is when a person who actually is not a partner he's not a partner but what he did he make he makes it known either by his words mean by his words or his conduct to others to the outsiders or to, to third, third party that he is a partner and because of his representation he will be made liable so many years to them this is actually not a partner but what she did so through his words or through his conduct he make other people believe actually that he is a partner and because of this action his action now he is being stopped from denying like liability meaning he cannot deny liability because he is being stopped from doing that because this through his action we have done this student last time under the topic of agency agency by as couple So the principle in that agency by estoppel will be applicable here also. So let us have a look in the case of Fox versus Clifton, whereby in this case uh, the uh, Chief Judge Tindall have explained what is the meaning of holding out. If you can read out the judgment of the Chief Justice Tindall, what he said, he said, holding out to the public as a partner requires a person to voluntarily hold himself out. So meaning what he did his action is voluntary is voluntarily it is his consent nobody forced him to do that so it requires a person to voluntarily hold himself out and this means he lends his name to the partnership he lends his name he gave his name to be used by the by the business and under ordinary circumstances this act takes place when a person allows his name this now we can see the words voluntarily meaning he himself allows his name to continue to be used by the firm where the public publicly positioned at the shop entrance or used in invoices or advertisement so that the knowledge or the consent of the person whose name is thus used because he is the one who consented to it he becomes and this becomes the basis to stop him so meaning estoppel applies here he cannot now deny liability as a partner though he is not partner okay so if person did this he actually is not entitled to profit of the firm however he will be liable yeah to the said firm okay student so that is the situation under common law in the case in the case which i have discussed with you just now so under our malaysian law this is actually under section 16 of our um under section 16 under our under our partnership act So let us have a look at section 16 student here what actually is the content of section 16 So if we read section 16 here it says here everyone meaning anybody who by word spoken or written so maybe he spoke it out orally or in writing or by conduct in any other way Okay. he represent himself or who normally suffers himself to be represented as a partner in a particular firm is liable as a partner to anyone 
who has on the face of such any representation. Okay? So, meaning, sama ada dia cakap, sama ada dia tulis, sama ada melalui perlakuan dia, okay, he shows to the outsiders, actually, he is a partner, and because that person believe, have faith, believe, you know, through that representation, and that person give credit to the firm, whether the representation has or has not been made or communicated to the person, so giving credit by or with the knowledge of the apparent partner making the representation or suffering it to be made. So, whether he knows or not, that this representation is being communicated to the party who give credit, he will still be liable. So, under section 16 actually, section 16, from section 16 which I have Read it out to you this now. There are actually three elements which need to be fulfilled before we can make a person liable under this category. What are actually these three elements? The first one, there must be a representation. This representation is being made by himself or by other person and, and he agrees to it, he consented to it. And if he does not consent, of course he cannot be made liable. So the words this now under section 16. So the, what is the words this now? The words this now, he knows and he never denies. Meaning he consented. Okay? And secondly, the third party who believes with regards to the representation, he believes that it's true and he acted upon this representation. How he acted? He gave credit to the state firm. Then this person who holds out will be liable. So let us have a look at these elements one by one in detail. The first one is you said that there must be a representation, whether the representation is made by him himself or the representation is being made by other by other parties, sorry, so by other parties, and he has never denied about it. So meaning he consented to it. Okay. So this re represent representation can be made in any form, either by words, or by actions, okay, whereby he allows his name to be used, and the representation no need to be made directly to the person who acts upon it. <clears throat> it is su sufficient enough if it has come to his knowledge through any sources. What does it mean through any sources? Maybe he read it through the newspaper, okay, or maybe. Uh, the name appear on the letter hit or on the invoices. Okay, so that's why you can see that sometimes we and 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 they are the one who actually recommend, recommend certain product during the advertisement, and people they actually their partners they can be made liable under that situation. So that's why it have to uh, you know before we can appear on behalf of any firm any business, we should be very careful with regards to this so that we will not be made uh, liable. So let us have a look at the case of Tower Cabinet Company Limited with Ingram. So what happened in this case, Ingram used to be a partner in the firm by the name of Marys, but then he had later on resigned from the said firm. However, his former partner, he had already resigned, had continued with the business under the same name, under the name of Marys. Yeah, what happened is that on one occasion, on one occasion, this uh, partner had used the firm old notes, whereby on these old notes, appear, uh, Ingram's name appear on the old notes. This is only one occasion, and this is very old notes. And then now, what the plaintiff is trying to do now, the plaintiff now tried to enforce judgment in, against Ingram due to this, to this uh, old notes, whereby his name appeared there. However, in this case, the court held that Ingram is not liable. Why? Why Ingram is not liable? Since his name appeared there. Because the court held that the fact that he failed to destroy, the fact that Ingram failed to destroy the said old notes or was negligent in not destroying the notes does not mean that he consented, he consented to be held out as a partner. Okay? He had not knowingly suffered himself to be represented as a partner. And because this is a very old note and only one occasion. And unless if, if 
the, the, the other partners have been using Ingram's names all the while, okay? Then under the situation, Ingram may be made uh, uh, may be made liable. However, under this situation, this is only one occasion whereby, uh, and this is actually an old note whereby uh, I think uh, Ingram so is not aware actually under the situation, and because of that, it's not fair to make him liable. It's not fair to say that he has consented to this. Okay, the second element which I've read to you just now says here the third party must rely on the representation. So meaning what is being made by the third party, he gave credit. Why he gave credit? He gave credit because he believed. He believed that, yeah, he, he, he believed that the other party is actually a partner. And he believed that actually this is true. Okay, if we can prove this, then the person who holds out will be had liable. And the third, yeah, the third, um, element is that because the third party believe he gave credit to the said firm. So what is meant by credit? Does credit means by giving money or by giving property to the firm? So our partnership act is silent on this. There is a lacuna on this. So we need to rely on this British case, on this uh, common law case of Lynch versus Steve whereby Lynch here is a salary partner. However, his name appears on the letter head. I taught you earlier, student, a salary partner actually is not a partner. However, here, his name appears on the letter head and then yeah, this particular client was being informed that this Mr. Lynch is the one who would do all his business. Okay? Because from this statement, from this statement, yeah, Steve, this uh, Steve conduct all dealings with Lynch except on one particular sale of property and investment, he conduct with the owner of the firm himself, which is John Williamson. Williamson and John Williamson misappropriated the said uh, money given by Lynch, and now he is suing, uh, misappropriated the said money given by, uh, by Steve, sorry, given by Steve, and now Steve is suing Lynch, and the court held that, a person who entrusts money to his solicitor for the purpose of investment give credit to the solicitor. If he gave money to the solicitor, meaning he gave credit to the solicitor, not to the firm. But it was recognized. The court had, it was recognized. Ianya adalah di itiraf that when a person continues dealing with a particular firm, he continues dealings with this firm because he believed that a person was a partner in himself amounted to giving credit to the firm. In this situation, Steve, all this while, he deals with whom? He deals with Lynch. He deals with Lynch because he believes Lynch is a partner. And this got hard amounts to giving credit to the same firm because on that belief. Okay, students, so now we are going to go on the final subtopic, which is the liability of incoming and retiring partners. So the general rule, of course, partners will only be liable yeah, with regards to transactions conducted by the firm whilst they are a partner in the firm. Because they are partners in the firm, that's why they, they, they will be liable to the same firm. Okay? So, therefore, a partner will not, will not be held liable for the firm liabilities that arose when he is not in the set in the set business. Meaning if he's not in the firm, he's not a partner, how could we make him liable? Because he is not in the set business. Unless if he holds out. That's why that's what I have discussed with you earlier. So earlier we have discussed on the topic of holding out. He is not a partner, but still he's been made liable. Why? Because this is exception, because he makes other people believe that he is a partner. If not, he will not be held liable because he is not in the business. He is not the partner of the business. That is the general rule range. Okay? So, we know that in the business, a partner may come and may go. So, meaning, business may take in new partners. And business also, in business also, 
sometimes the partners might resign from the same business. So that's why it's necessary for us to know whether this new partner is liable to the debts and obligation of the firm where he is not a partner and whether a re retiring pa partner can actually seize liability uh, for the debts of the firm because he had already left the firm. So to discuss this, we need to look at section 19 of the Partnership Act. And section 19 of the Partnership Act is divided into three parts. Part 1 says here, a person who is admitted as a partner, so meaning this is incoming partners, a new partner, okay, into an existing firm, does not, the words there is does not, meaning he is not liable to the creators of the firm for anything before he became a partner. He will not be held liable before he became a partner. Okay? That is number one, subsection one. Subsection two says here, a partner who retires, a partner who left the firm, okay, does not thereby cease to be liable for partnership debts or obligations incurred before his retirement. So meaning all those debts, all those liabilities which incurred while he is while he is a partner, he will still be liable for these debts. He will be he will still be made liable towards these debts. Okay? So now let us have a look at subsection 3 it says here. A retiring partner, so mainly now we are still referring to this partner under subsection 2 just now. This is a retiring partner. He may be discharged from any existing liabilities. So meaning he can escape liabilities. He can escape liabilities. How he can escape liabilities, student? He can escape liabilities by an agreement to the effect between himself. So meaning... He needs to enter a new agreement. This is some sort of novation. Agreement between him, the members of the newly constituted, constituted firm. So now, is this, this is a new firm with, with a new partners there. Or maybe there is new partners. By, but then when he left the firm, now this firm is newly constituted. So meaning there must be an agreement between him, the newly constituted firm and also the creditors. All these three parties then have to agree to this to discharge him from the state level with this. Okay, then he will be discharged. So let us discuss this in detail with regards to the liability of the incoming partners. Okay, with regards to the liability of incoming partners first, before we go on with the liabilities of the retiring partners. So just now we have discussed section 19. And section 19 one, this is the section. Just now I've read to you, I said these new partners, they are not liable towards whatever liabilities, whatever debts they belong to the firm before they become partners. However, student, these new partners, can you read my, my notes here? These new partners, if he agrees to be liable, to be liable, he himself agrees to be liable for the existing debts of the partnership when he is being admitted as a, as a partner for so this is allowed but how 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 is need to be done then then all the parties who is all the parties the parties are these three parties the creditor the old firm the new firm okay they need to sign this new set of agreement showing that they agree that now these uh, that's the liability of the the, the said firm will also be shared by these new partners okay so um there are situations when this occur actually there are situations when this occur and sometimes uh when um, like, like like the case of this is not partnership but it's quite similar situation the case of mars uh, Ma, uh, kazana know that mars is suffering loss however kazana is willing to take over mars it's some sort like this actually yeah, whereby if this new partners is willing to take over the said debts or not however they need to sign a new set of agreements saying that it's within between all the partners all the parties so this agreement can either be expressed express meaning it can be made in writing or it can be implied from the conduct of the parties okay so as long as all the three parties agree to it 
so let me highlight to you this case this case shows how we said that this is an implied agreement so in the case of Roth and Bank of Australasia it's not Australia okay student is Astro Australasia was a flower sorting and company so whereby in this case this WH and F this is a trading company under the name of William Rutledge and company and then they took in their clubs which is T and S as their partners okay this newly constituted firm meaning this firm with the uh, club as the new partners they trade under the old name and they make use of the uh, same books of account how, the manner how it's being kept the procedure is this is the same and the old firm actually is indebted in the amount of eighty thousand pound and it's been proved that this debt and the interest payable in respect of it were regularly recorded it's been recorded in these uh, books of account and tns the new partners because they are actually the clerk in the firm in the old firm they have access to this to this to these account books they have access to this record so meaning they are fully aware of the situation and they and they never deny about this and the old firm continue dealings with this um with uh, with with this plaintiff uh, like the old firm before the procedure everything is the same and the court held actually now this new partner they are being held liable because this shows that there is an implied agreement whereby they are willing to take the responsibilities why because they have never denied they are fully aware because they work in the firm they are the clerk of the firm they have access to the firm and they have never denied this liability they never dispute all the entries which is being done in the said in the said book of accounts okay now let us go on with regards to the liability of a retiring partner so under section 19 subsection 2 just now which which I've read to you it says that this retiring partners will still be liable it, it, it will not cease liability though they have left the firm so meaning the liability of the firm before they leave the firm they will be liable towards that towards towards that liabilities this is clearly shown in the case of Malayan Banking Burhat versus Lim Chi Lang so what happened in this case is that the respondent they are partners in the firm called Bajasa Corporation and then appellants then sue the said firm on a trust receipt which matured and become payable on the 14th of June 1975 and this trust receipt actually this trust receipt actually matured on the 14th of June 1975 whereas these two respondents leave the said firm on the 20th of August okay meaning a year after the trust receipt had become matured and the court held that this respondent actually is liable towards this trust receipt yeah, though they have resigned because that trust received the state that occurred before they before they resigned okay so that is very clear about that about about uh, liabilities before they resign they will be made liable so what about uh those debts after they have resigned will, will they be also held liable so if these retiring partners wanted to escape from these liabilities of course they need to enter into a new set of agreement which is known as innovation however most probably the creditor will not agree to this okay most probably there are situations whereby the creditors will agree but most probably they will not agree to to discharge the state the state uh, partners who resigned so what about as i asked you just now student what about those liabilities incurred by the partners after incurred by the firm after the partners have left the firm so for this kind of of debts the said partner will still be liable to this third party unless he has given express notice that he is 
no longer a partner. And actually, if we look at section 38, subsection 1, the section says here, where a person deals with a firm after a change in his constitution. Okay, so meaning if a person is a client third party, a conduct transaction with the firm after the said partners have left, and this guy, this third party, he is entitled to treat, to treat all apparent members of the old firm as still being members. So he can treat as if the resigned partners is still a partners until he has notice of the change. So meaning, under this issue, it shows that a notice need to be given to this person that he is no more a partner. And this notice actually, there are two kinds of notice. So what are these two kinds of notice? For an old customer, who uh, the customer who habitually have dealings with the same firm, uh, an, an actual notice to be need to be given to him. This is uh, clearly under section 38 sub, sub 1. However, for future customers, so these future customers, future customers, they are not aware actually who are actually the partners of the same firm previously. And under that situation, a general notice is enough. And just by giving a general notice in the Federal Gazette, and for a sub uh, for Sabah Sabah Gazette, Sarawak for Sarawak Gazette depends where actually is the business of the said firm. Okay, just just give this this general notice with regards to the retirement and under that situation, these uh, partners who left the firm will not be liable for the said uh, future debts with regards to uh, new clients. Okay, however, for all clients, for clients who used to have habitual dealings with the said firm then he needs to give this actual notice. Okay, let us have a look in the case of Resuin Steamship Company, whereby in this situation, this retiring partners did give notice. He gave notice by, by, by posting an advertisement in several newspaper. And after he resigned, some of the old customers lend money to the firm and this old customer now, they are not aware that this partner have left the firm okay so they gave security in the form of promissory notes to the uh, remaining partners they gave they gave uh they they lend money to the same firm and as security the firm gave them promissory notes and then later on they sued the retiring partners based on these promissory notes and uh, these retiring partners uh, deny liability by saying that they have already given notice they have advertised it. However, what the court held? The court held that the retiring partners is liable on the notes. Why? Because this is an old customer. An old customers, a notice need to be given is an actual notice. Need to inform them personally. Okay? This is the case of review instinctship. In the case of Tan Simo. Tan Simo. <coughs> so this is the last case today. This will also be our last topic today. In the case of Tan Simo, Tan Simo, a person who had habitual dealings, had habitual dealings with the firm, was entitled to be specifically notified of partners resigning from the said firm. It, it shows that if this client had habitual dealings with the firm, then he need to be notified personally. He need to be informed specifically specifically with regards to the say resignation. Okay, student, thank you. So this is the topic of liability of partners. We have covered all the subtopics and uh, the topics after this is relation of partners in the same. Thank you, stay safe and have a good day.